Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and about what's next. It's a show that wants to ask questions, peel back the layers of our average everyday experience, and go beyond scratching the surface. We interview amazing people with incredible ideas and stories who have done wild, weird, and wonderful things. Remember that imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I'm David Peck, and this is Face to Face. So my next guest uh, for me was a real privilege to get the opportunity to interview him. His name is Jürgen Tudenhofer. He is a author. He is a former judge, a pilot. He has been around. Uh, let me tell you, his book, My Journey into the Heart of Terror, is well worth the read. The subtitled 10 Days in the Islamic State. I will read here, quote, an alarming and enlightening firsthand account of what's really going on behind the borders of the Islamic State, close quote. Uh, Jürgen and I had a conversation about his book, about his 10 days uh, with uh, ISIS and uh, on the ground and what that meant for him and his son, uh, why uh, ideology and Islam have very little, if anything, uh, in common. We talk about alternatives to the war on terror and the way uh, things are unfolding and, and why Jürgen still has hope and and why he believes that the strategy that, that that most Western countries are taking with respect to trying to defeat ISIS is completely wrong. I think you're going to really enjoy the interview. There's a lot going on here, and uh, I'm hoping it's going to make you want to dig a little bit deeper. DavidPeckLive.com for more podcasts. Check us out there online. And uh, my next guest, author of my journey into the heart of terror 10 days in the Islamic State Jürgen Tudenhofer is coming up well welcome to face to face we are joined by a, a very special guest today he is a journalist he's a uh, a, a man that's hard to pin down, I think, in some respects, but he's written a book recently called My Journey into the Heart of Terror. Jürgen Tudenhofer is here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So I have so many questions. Um, uh, the subtitle of your book is 10 Days in the Islamic State. How does a book like this get its genesis, get its start? Where where was the seed planted with you? I mean, clearly this is something that's been on your heart for years. Tell me more about the the the, the fire burning within. I wrote some books about the Middle East. I'm a former member of the German parliament. And they were all quite successful. And I went very often to Syria. I, I love Syria. It's half oriental, half uh, European, and and I went there for holidays before the revolution and so on. And then the revolution started, I went there again, I've been after the revolution I think nine or ten times, and I have something that I'm always doing, I am always speaking with all the sides, at least with both sides, but sometimes with three or four sides. So I spoke with leaders of the rebels, not only the Free Syrian Army, but Al-Qaeda, for example. And I spoke several times with the president of Syria, Assad. Mm. I made an interview with him. And so I tried to find out what was happening in Syria. And suddenly ISIS arrived. And I said that we, ha- we, we, we will have a terror problem in Syria, but the media said, no, this is only, these are lies, there are no terrorists, there are only demonstrations for democracy. And I said, yes, there, there were dem- demonstrations for democracy, very strong ones. And, but now we have terrorist problems. The, the scene has changed. And I wanted to meet these people. There's not only one terrorist organization. There's not only ISIS there. there a lot of others that you will not know. And then with, together with my son, we found out the internet addresses of round about 80 German jihadists. Right. And we contacted them. Which is, which is so, Jürgen, that's so surreal to me and so 
almost science fiction like that you were able to access that kind of information so easily. Yeah, but at this time, nobody did it. You know, even the Secret Service didn't do it. So, uh, but together with my son, he said, my, my dad wants to speak to you. He had to send many letters. And, and some of them, German GIDs, know me because they know my books. And we had 15 who wanted to talk to me, and, and we were speaking to around about 15. And at the end, we had two. One who was not ISIS, and another one who was officially assigned by the leadership of ISIS to speak with me. They wanted to, to control the conversation, and they wanted me to speak with somebody who knew really the official ideology and the official strategy and, and so on. And is that, and, uh, is that Salim, the, the man that you write about? No, no. Salim is, is a guy who was working with Al-Qaeda, he was working with ISIS, and then he left and he joined another terror organization. He was disappointed, he said, ISIS people, they are completely crazy. They yeah. are. And he's right. No, it was Abu Qatada. And I had Skype discussions when you spent your holiday afternoon, your Sunday afternoon with friends or, and family, I was closing the curtains and I was Skyping with Raqqa and with a terrorist. And we had long conversations, two hours, three hours, four hours. And I tried to find out everything. We spoke about everything. We, we spoke about the beheadings, we spoke about slavery and, and so on and so on. And at the same time, I said, I want to see the Islamic State. And at this time, James Foley was beheaded. James Foley, this American journalist, and I knew him personally. Wow. I have okay. him in Benghazi during the Libyan revolution. He was in the same hotel. And I said, why are you killing these people? So I knew the danger. And I said, I need a guarantee from the Caliph. And he said, yes, the Caliph, you will <laughs> the Caliph doesn't care about you. And I said, yeah, then it's okay, but then I will not come. At the end, I had a guarantee from the cabinet of the Caliph. And he left. And how, and, son, how, and how difficult was it to convince your son to come with you as well as photographer? No, it... I didn't want him to come with me. I bet. I, I was sure that the guarantee would work because the IS or ISIS wants to be seen as a state. And they gave this guarantee as a state. And they published the guarantee. We, the Islamic State, guarantee that Mr. Todmacher will have the possibility to go to the Islamic State, and we, he will come. He will come back safe, and and so on. And I was pretty sure that I had a chance to come back, but my son said, "No, that's a trick. They want to kill you. They need a prominent. I'm not very prominent, but they need a prominent guy." And and I said, "Yes, but they will not invest six months of conversations with me and and." On. He said, it's a trick. And he asked me always not to, to come. And when they published the invitation and the guarantee on Twitter, there were many comments from, from IS fans. Right, that. Said, wonderful, wonderful. Keep him. We had him. At last we have, we have a, a prominent guy. And, oh, that's wonderful. Kill him. Had him, and so on. And my son was always showing this kind of comments to me and saying, it's, You see what they think. And I said, And then he saw that he couldn't persuade me that I, I was ready to go. And then he said, I'm coming with you. I said, No, you are not coming with me. You're the only man in our family. I have two other girls, daughters, and they need you. And he said, You cannot do this to me. I have helped you to go to the Islamic State, and if something will happen to you, I will have the responsibility for my whole life. You cannot do that to me. I, you cannot make feel me guilty, and now you have to take me with you. 
And he needed much more courage, I think, because he was completely persuaded that he would be killed. But wow. he didn't at all. So you spent actually 10 days with uh, these folks from the Islamic State. How long was the trip all in from the day that you started packing your bags till the day that you were back in Germany, feeling safe and somewhat back together again? More than two weeks because we had to spend a lot of time in Gaziantep. And, you know, Gaziantep is a Turkish city near the border and to get in touch with these terrorists. And it, it was like, like in a bad film, you know, you had to call a certain number and then somebody else wow. called you back and you were told to call another number and and it, it was completely crazy. You take a taxi and to go to a certain place and then someone else would take you. And so we, had, we, we spent a lot of time in Turkey also. Did, did, did either of you sleep? during this two week period. I mean, I, I just, I can't imagine you not being high on adrenaline the whole time. No, I, not, not really. It's, you know, it's a luxury to, to be anxious or to, to fear anything in, in such a situation. If you take the decision to go, then you cannot be afraid anymore. You cannot be scared anymore. During the this almost six months, I was Skyping with this IS guy, Abu Qatada. I felt sometimes when I was going to bed, a knife on my throat. And the, the, not the sharp side, the other one. And then I, I went to, I have a little balcony, not even 10 meters, square meters. And I, I went outside and I was thinking and, and trying to get calm. And, but when we left, I knew I had no right to fear anything. It's like when you climb on a mountain. When you start, you, you cannot be afraid after, after a thousand meters and say, oh, now I don't want to continue, oh, it's horrible. You have to go yeah. ahead. There's no other chance. You you made you made this decision and you moved forward. So I, I think I've I think I, I read in the book uh, maybe saw you in an interview where you responded to a journalist or in the, like I say in the book you say that you were in the pursuit of truth. Would you say that the reason for writing this book was it? I mean, is this a historical document, Jürgen, in a sense? Uh, are you are you acting as a as a former judge here? Are you are you purely a journalist? Are you a father? Uh, you know, you want the world to know what's what's clearly going on here. You've had access in a way that no one else has. What what kind of conclusions do you come up with? You know, uh, it, you know, is it about ending terrorism? Is it about understanding our enemy? Is it about understanding others? you know, and about the ability to listen and so on. You know, you, you talked about how you wanted to meet with more than, you know, you wanted to meet everyone when you went to Syria. And I love that. You know, my background is international development. So I tell my students all the time, they have to listen. You know, they have to listen to others. And so I, I, I love that, the way you said that you wanted to, you know, be with everyone. You know, I'm not a journalist. I'm completely independent. I was a member of the parliament, I was a judge, I was the boss of a big media company for 20, during 22 years. It's an international media company. And then I, I started writing when the war on terror started. And more and more I wanted to show the real face of war and the real face of terror, terrorism. War has nothing heroic when you go in a war in hospital, when you see dying children or, or dying soldiers or whatever, or, or dying mothers. And it's the same with terrorism. I was a judge in a terrorist uh, trial. And so this is one target, dismantle, to show people what it is. It's a big lie 
and terrorism is a big lie. And and then there is another point. I I am fighting for respect for other cultures. You know, Germany has failed to have enough respect for centuries, not only 80 years ago, towards the Jews. And now we are making the mistake to have uh, to speak badly about Muslims and not to understand their culture. And so I wanted to, to always in my books to show how Muslims live. That Muslims are less fanatic than we think, less fanatic than, than many Europeans. They're, they're extremely tolerant. They're completely different. Because, but we are always, we get pictures of, of terrorists. Of course, terrorists are not tolerant. Like, uh, like soldiers are not tolerant when they are fighting. And these were things I, I wanted to do. And I found out that if you sit at home and if you see the things only on internet or reading only newspapers, you cannot really judge it. So I had to go there. And, and I started this at the age of, of 18. I went to the war in Algeria, the French against the Algerians, the independence war. And I was the, the first Western politician who went together, in this case with Mujahideen, I mean, crossed the Hindu Kush and went to Afghanistan. And the Russian, the spokesman of Brezhnev, the Secretary General of the Soviet Union said publicly, if they catch me, they will kill me. And we had, Germany had a lot of diplomatic troubles with all these guys. It, so, so, it sounds to me like in another, in another life, you might have been a, um, uh, a mountain climber or a, a, a spelunker or something, you know, this, that, 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 the situations you've been in throughout your life are, are you know, um, frankly terrifying. <laughs> But I tried to find out the truth, and nobody was speaking about the war in Afghanistan, and, and I wanted to say what is true. And therefore, I went, I was on the Tahir Square when Mubarak gave up. I was in Libya, in a, and, and a friend of mine died, our host and driver and friend. He was killed by Gaddafi troops, and I went there when something happened. I wanted to find out what, what the Arab Spring really was. Um, Jürgen, do you think that, I mean, is this a, you know, you call, you call terrorism in your book a global phenomenon. Um, do you think, do you think people are seeking truth globally as well? I mean, yeah. you know, is this, or, or are there pockets of it here and there? Um, does that make sense? I think you are right. I think truth is not a truth doesn't have a high value. So in wars, and I even can understand it. If you have a war, if the United States have a war, and if there are allies in Fallujah, for example, now in Fallujah, Iraq, are beheading the allies of the United States are beheading young people who flee from Fallujah. They are not interested to tell the truth about that. Why should they? They risk the life of their, their people. So truth in a war doesn't play a role. And truth, and I cannot expect that terrorists tell me the truth. Why should they? They tell lies, they make propaganda, and workers make propaganda. When did George W. Bush tell the truth? When did Tony Blair tell the truth? When did Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi tell the truth? When did Bin Laden tell the truth? That's, they don't tell the truth. They, they try to persuade people that they are right and that they should fight and that they should kill each other. And, and that's the reason why I tried to go there and why I tried to find out what was wrong. Jürgen, was do, you, wrong. Jürgen do you think I want to. I want to quote somebody, the, a judge that you interview uh, in in the book, and you're talking about uh, Sharia law, I believe, 
and it's later in the book. Uh, it's a part of the journal uh, portion of the book, which takes up quite a bit of it, actually. And um, it's the date is Thursday, December 11th, 2014. And you're talking with this. And he responds and he says, uh, the reason they were killed, the reason these people were put to death is because they put the laws of man above the laws of God. Apart from that, many of them were corrupt. Uh, we are only Sharia. We don't interpret. We just apply what is written. Close quote. And so they, they on some level, look at the text and they say, this is true. So therefore, we have to behave a certain way. Or therefore, we have to invoke a certain law. But, but what fascinates me is they say they actually claim to not interpret but the mere act of acting on the printed text, it seems to me, is an interpretation of one kind or another. And millions of Muslims don't interpret the text this way. To me, it's almost, I don't want to reduce this, but it's almost a philosophical problem. It's, it's a philosophical problem because most of the IS people I met didn't really understand the Quran. I read it three times. I read the Bible, the Old Testament three times. You know, there are horrible parts in the Old Testament. Absolutely. In the Bible. Talking, let's say, just actually about homosexuality. Read Leviticus or read Roma, Roman, or, or whatever, it's its just horrible, and, and read the Quran, and that's as horrible as the, the, the Bible. So we have to know that certain parts of these so-called holy books have been written thousands of years ago. And these, and as a judge, you cannot say there is the Quran, and I apply the laws of the Quran, 99% of the things that a judge has to judge are not written in the Quran. They have to think, they have to find out what is just, it's just not true that something is written in the Quran. And, and, and of course, most of the things I had to judge in my short time as a judge were not written in the Bible. So you, you, can, you have to find out the spirit of a book. So the spirit is of, I, I, I would say, of the New Testament. Christianity is love your neighbor. Love, give your love to your, to, 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 to your neighbors, to all the people around you. And the spirit of Quran, which is surprising for some in the Western country, 113 of 114 surahs start with the words in the name of God, the most merciful, the most gracious. It, it, it's not right. in the name of God, the most cruel right. and the most horrible. And I ask this terrorist, where is your mercy? Where's the where's mercy? mercy? Where's, where's the mercy? Where's the grace? And that's the, the sense of Quran. And... and but they have, they want to kill ISIS, and that's the reason why, I think it's the main reason why my, at the end, in an open letter to the Caliph, I was so hard with ISIS. They want to kill all the people, besides Jews, Christians, and IS Muslims. And I said, why only IS Muslims? Do you want to kill also the Muslims in in the Western countries? Yes, of course. All the democratic Muslims in the Western world have to be killed. I said, oh, why? What are you talking about? The Muslims said, I didn't mention Canada. The Muslims in Canada, you want to kill them? Why? Because they follow the laws of man. Mm. Because they believe in democracy. Democracy means that human beings are making laws. And this is not allowed. We can only follow the laws of God, that's completely bullshit. It's crazy. In the his whole history of Islam, they always applied laws made by man. Right. And that's normal. But they consider also the moderate Muslims in the Western world as their enemies. And they want to fight against them. And, 
And our politicians don't instant, understand enough that 99% of the Muslims living here are our allies. Yes. They don't like these killers. They don't like the philosophy to behead somebody or to enslave somebody or to rape somebody because he is a slave. So there are so many misunderstandings and when I see now the the discussion in the United States during the elections, what what Donald Trump is saying and I I just think they, they don't know what they are talking about. Well and and, and, and even and even recently now with the with the Orlando shootings and how immediately the rhetoric is just so one sided. Or at least it seems to be from a from a conservative perspective. At least Hillary Clinton and, and President Obama tried in some way to to offset some of the crazy rhetoric that, that was 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 bubbling to the surface. It's just it's remarkable. As a Canadian, I I you know, the conversations we've been having even as families and friends and neighbors, we just, we, what, what do you do but shake your head and say, we hope for a better day? Uh, it, it seems like, you know, it's interesting. It's a, nice, it's a nice segue into a conversation that you had. You interview Salim at the beginning of the book. And he says this, and I, I really, I'm really interested to know because it sounds like you got to know him quite well. And he was a, uh, um, uh, to be clear, an ISIS supporter from Germany. Correct? Yeah. And, and he, was, he, he was against ISIS. Sorry, against. Uh, but yeah. he, he says here, uh, I am convinced here that what I am doing is the right thing. How, yeah. do, you, how, do, you, how do you ever have a conversation with anyone? How do you ever move the dialogue forward? You know, and as a judge, you must have seen this before with people that you would sentence and criminals and so. How do you get people out of their own heads, out of their own frameworks, out of their, you know, to step outside to say, "Oh, you know what, Jurgen, you're right. There is no mercy. There is no grace in the way that we're operating, in the way that we're behaving." They said, for example, when I said, where is your mercy, once they said everybody had another answer because they were not used to think about that. And one said, you know, we captured 3,500 Shias, that's a conf Muslim confession, in Mosul, but we killed only 50%. And those who were not killed, you know, this was our mercy. Wow. You're not, you're kidding me? And these people are brainwashed. They are all brainwashed and, and the story is always the same. They have been Protestants when they, when they are jihadi, jihadis coming from Western countries. They have been, most of them, Protestants, then they convert. And then they are excluded from the society. A Muslim in the Western world is a second class citizen. We have had today in Germany a survey showing what the Turkish people think. They love Germany, but they don't feel accepted. Mm. They, not, more than 90% are that, that, that's a great country, but we are not accepted. Sec we are second class citizens. So these young guys are second class citizens. And then comes the brainwasher. For the guys I I was with the guys Abu Qatada from Solingen in Germany. The brainwasher was an Austrian, and he had, you can see his speech, his name is Mohammed Mahmoud, he's dead now, and you can see his speech. He always says, you're discriminated, you're treated badly. And they say, yeah, of course, yeah. No, it doesn't matter. And you're completely unimportant, you're nothing here. And do you know what is happening to the kids, to our brothers and sisters in Iraq? Do you know how they kill kids in Iraq and in Afghanistan? Have you seen the pictures? And they have, of course. And then he, and they say, yeah, we have. And then he says, and you are sitting here and you are doing nothing. Right. What are you doing for, for these poor people? Why aren't you defending them? So I understand all this. This part, I can understand it completely. 
because in, what we have done in Iraq is, is uh, horrible, and what we have done also, we Germans, what we have done in Afghanistan sometimes was, was horrible. So I can understand that. And then they tell them, and you know, in the northern part of Syria, there's now a battle in Dabiq. There's a battle between good and evil. Mm. It's the final battle. It's the apocalyptic battle. And you will fight on the side of the good ones. And then come the most important words. And you will go there, when you go there, you will be important. They have never been important in their life. And you will be writing history. You will be a historical figure. So I remember when I was 20 years old, I was completely unimportant and I felt it. But if you are told you are important, you will be important. And all these poor guys, sometimes also intelligent guys, they go to the Islamic State and they are told we are important. We are changing the world. We are fighting against the coalition, anti-IS coalition with more than 60 nations, the United States, Canada, and, and UK, and so on. And you are important. So all these parts of the brainwashing is understandable. That's not difficult. That's some truth. So yeah, not the battle between good and evil. That's another story. But then, that's that's the horrible thing. If you brainwash somebody, if you have two good points, we have, they have treated our brothers and sisters in Iraq badly, and we should defend them. There you have two good points, and then brainwash people don't think anymore. They stop thinking. They, the, the third step, the fourth step, they don't think about it. And they think because they understand, oh, we are discriminated. The Muslims in the world are discriminated. And, and so on and so on, and we don't defend them. They think that it is allowed to kill innocents. And they don't think anymore. I ask them how you are protesting against the fact that the Americans have killed innocents in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And you kill innocents. What do you say? They, they didn't think about that. Right. You, when you are brainwashed, you go forwards and you don't think anymore. And I said, you, are, you have introduced slavery. How can you do that? You want to change? Oh, you know, you have slavery too. Sexual slavery and prostitution and so on and so on. They don't think anymore. So A brainwashed guy... That's, that's the problem. doesn't you're, think anymore. You're, 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 is, well, we're, we're probably going to have to wrap up the interview here in a couple of minutes, but I'm, I'm fascinated by, I mean, I have so many more questions, and I, I hope that maybe we can do a part two uh, uh, for this interview down the road. But, you know, as a, as a, a social change uh, consultant and a guy who teaches in international development and who travels a fair bit, um, I'm always about being, uh, or at least I try to be, uh, as cross-cultural as I can. And I try, you know, I'm the six-foot white guy. It's it's kind of hard not to stand out when you go into another country. I travel to Cambodia quite often. But my thing is about listening, about, about trying to include the other. Do, you know, as I heard you talk about some of the, the, the young men, I suppose, and women who are indoctrinated with this ideology, which you claim, by the way, has nothing to do with Islam, which I, which, you know, I think is absolutely right. Um, is this a, I mean, is a way to break this pattern by, by, uh, humanizing this a bit more by, by listening? I mean, is there any way that we can break out of this? Or is this just something the world, you know, you call terrorism a global phenomenon. Is this something we're just going to have to figure out how to live with going into the future? No, there is a chance that we persuade those who are still living in our countries that IS has nothing to do with Islam. Islam doesn't allow to force somebody to believe something. It's not allowed in, in Islam. 
Islam doesn't allow to kill innocent civilians. That's so clear in Islam and in Quran. Islam doesn't allow to destroy churches, synagogues, or mosques. And that's what they are doing every day. You can explain. I, I wrote yesterday an open letter to the IS fans in Germany. Hmm. And I was trying to explain, you're fighting against Islam, you're not fighting for Islam. Right. That's, this is something we can do. You have a, 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 there's a great guy, he plays a role in, in the film that we have made these days. It's Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. He was a close friend to Muhammad Ali and he can explain these things in a wonderful way and he should, should get as, as many opportunities to, to speak to, to young Muslims. But there's also another thing, our strategy to defeat ISIS is wrong. Hmm. ISIS was created by this butcher, by, by this killer Zakabi. Zakabi was the guy with a sword who was beheading journalists in front of a camera. And Zakabi created the yeah, created ISIS. The, the name was partly for monotheism and jihadism, but it, it was ISIS. It became after some months Al Qaeda in Iraq and then Islamic State in Iraq, ISI. It was created six months after the invasion of George W. Bush. Terrorism is an answer, an, an unacceptable answer, a criminal answer to our wars. So violent, violence Very clear violence. to criminal wars. And we should, and, and we are fighting now ISIS with wars. But the wars are the reason mm. of terrorism. Because with, when you are bombarding, I was a pilot for, for six years, private pilot, not, not very important. But if you bombard, 90% of your victims are innocents. So this is creating terrorism. Our bombardments who killed all these Iraqis and Afghanis were a terror breeding program. And we should stop that. And there are other strategies. For example, in Iraq. In Iraq, we have, in Iraq, the Sunni population. In Iraq, we have Shias, that's the majority, two thirds of the Iraqis are Shias, and we have Sunnis. One third, 10 million people are Sunnis. The Sunnis have been kicked out of the political life after the invasion of Tosha Libus. They don't play a political role anymore. They feel discriminated, and for this reason, they tolerated ISIS when ISIS attacked Mosul, Ramadi, Fallujah, etc. But now they are fed up with ISIS. They say that that's so brutal, this is not Iraqi, this is not our culture. And they, the leaders of the Sunnis, are ready to fight against ISIS. And I met these leaders, I know them, I, I've written a book about it in 2007. And they are also former Ba'athists, mm. member of the Ba'ath party of uh, Saddam Hussein. And not all the members of these parties were criminals, because to be in this party was the only chance to play a role in Iraq, because there was only this party. And these guys, the Sunnis and the Iraqi resistance, they want to fight against ISIS. They say we will fight against them if we get a guarantee that we will get the same rights as the Shias in Iraq. They, they have made an official offer. This offer is on the table of the White House. Hmm. There is an alternative to bombarding. And if yeah. Sunni Arabs would defeat ISIS, then ISIS would be defeated completely. If ISIS is defeated by Western troops or Western bombs, that's a new story. They so, will go in the underground and they will have a new reason to make terrorist acts against us because they have been defeated by Western airplanes. You're, you're so, gonna, I, but, I need to ask you, um, am I hearing a little bit of hope in your voice? That, 
you should never give up hope. <laughs> it's good. When I write these things, when I say, our, you know, I'm completely against terrorism. German terrorists have killed my best friend. Mm. And there's no excuse for terrorism. But I must say also, we should say there is no excuse for a war like the war against Iraq. And I, I think in a fair world, that's a lot I know, I, I'm, I'm not a dreamer. I'm a dreamer, but I'm not a dreamer. Right. In a fair world, terrorism has no chance. And the Americans have spent hundred and seventy thousand billions of dollars for the war on terror. If they had spent, or if they would spend, 50% of that money was for universities, right. for, for hospital infrastructure, you know. Yeah, where, where would we be today? Exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Terror wouldn't exist anymore. I and, think... And, these are the solutions. In a, in, in a, in, the quote for me is, in a fair world, terrorism has no chance. It's a, it's a wonder, wonderful quote. Tell us, just as we wrap up, a little bit about, I'm excited for you uh, and your son, uh, about your new film coming out, Inside IS. And also, I just wanted to say, is it not true that all the, uh, the proceeds from your book, My Journey into the Heart of Terror, that you're donating into uh, NGOs and organizations working in in some of these countries that are, have been affected by the war, uh, can you can you talk a tiny bit about that, and then tell us about the film and how we can get access to it? But the, the film is now sold by an international distribution company, and this in distribution company has already sold it to, I, I think, ten countries, the whole Middle East, Germany, and so on. I I don't think it is not yet sold in Canada. Okay. I don't think that this will be very expensive, and I don't get a penny. I give the the earnings, and my son also. My son has made the film. We give the earnings to kids in Damascus who have lost their arm or their leg, so for prosthesis. It's amazing. That's their dream. They want to have a prosthesis, and I don't want to make money with with books about terrorism. I, 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 no. I gave the money, I, I constructed together with friends in Gaza a soccer field, a soccer field with, with grass coming from Israel, by the way, a very amazing story, or I'm financing in, in Damascus orphans I, I'm, I'm paying all they need for the school, the, the clothing and all the material they need. And I have the impression that, that we have to do something. And Absolutely. when I give, for example, to, to kids in Gaza a soccer field, it's giving them hope. They see, oh, there are people who haven't forget, forgotten us. And if I can go to these guys, to this, it's a, it's, it's a priest in Damascus, it's a Christian priest who is constructing these prostheses. And when these kids get their prostheses, they are so happy. Okay. And I, they get a little bit of hope that there are people in this world who don't want, who don't see war as a solution and who don't see terrorism as a solution. And so I think everybody can do something. And, and the film is, I think, I was surprised by the film. We, we showed the film 10 days ago because my son had filmed and the, the filming was very difficult because he was pushed by, by fans of ISIS who thought, what is this young guy filming? We are beheading. Journalists, we don't let them film. Right. So it was surprising for them, and he has been in difficult situations. And and sometimes when he took photos, we saw it later. They put the machine gun on his head from behind, 
and we were always surrounded by by terrorists when we were filming. It was censored. There was a censorship every evening, every night. We had to show the material. They they didn't take they take, took let's say ten percent out. For example, in the Islamic State, there are no beggars anymore. You know, that's right. the holy holy land. They say no beggars. But Frederick, my son, had taken a photo with a female beggar. So they deleted it. Right, right. So that's the kind of, of things. And But what was difficult what, was the, the, the fact that you were all surrounded by machine guns. And I interviewed a young fighter who was one of these 300 guys who conquered Mosul against 25,000 elite troops of the Iraqi army. And after the interview, I'm, I don't make film interviews usually, right. I wanted to shake hand. He refused. Wow. To take. And then some minutes later he came to me and he said, there was something necessary for he for him to tell me and if he could and I thought he had a problem and I thought he had an uncle in Germany and I could do something. He said, I just want to tell you something. You have a guarantee for the Islamic State here. And we will stick to our word. But it's not for Germany. And we will come to Germany. We will seek you. We will find you. And we will kill you. And he made this sign. Wow. And it was filming in this atmosphere and and spending ten days in a kind of parallel parallel world. Yes. Yeah, no doubt. Sometimes sleeping on the floor together with terrorists and between us was only a Kalashnikov. So it was not easy to make a film. But I think the film is very well, you interesting. You've made a film and you've written a book, and I want to thank you for it, and congratulations. Uh, the book is uh, My Journey into the Heart of Terror, Ten Days in the Islamic State. Jürgen Todenhofer is a German writer. He's a politician, former judge, one of the most prominent German critics of the U.S.-led wars against Afghanistan and Iraq in uh, 2001 and three. And um, first, uh, first and uh, Western journalist to be allowed extensive ad access to ISIS-controlled territory. Jürgen, thank you so much for your time today uh i will urge my uh, listeners to to pick up the book but to, to 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 do our best to see the film as well i know uh i'm uh, i'm looking forward to seeing it thank you so much for your insight and your 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 honesty and your transparency today thank you so much for your kindness and this interview thank you very much goodbye hope to see you